give words for inviting me to do this. Sanjeev, Anjum, it's a real pleasure to be here with Chris, an old friend, and with Vinod. So let's get on with this quickly. There's so much to talk about. Uh, Vinod, why did you write about a almost forgotten Syed Hussain, who died 72 years ago and uh, had been relegated to the sidelines? Now, thanks to you, he's impacted on our consciousness again. What made you think that he would be, could be relevant today, should be relevant? So, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's really a pleasure to be in Calcutta. Before I answer your question, Andrela, uh, a small point. Coincidentally, today my Facebook memory threw up the memories saying that I was in Calcutta exactly two years to the day, staying at the Bengal Club because I had come here to do research in my book. <laughs> and why did I come to Calcutta? Because this gentleman, Mr. Syed Hussain, is actually a Calcutta boy. He was born here, uh, grew up in Calcutta, uh, lived in Taltala, and studied at the Calcutta Madrasa, which is now known as the Aliyah University. So that's the reason why I came here, and it's certainly a pleasure to be back in this city again. And it couldn't have been more appropriate that my session is in Calcutta. But to answer your question, Andrila, is uh, I mean, why Sai the same? It, this book was unintended. I mean, I had no claims to either being an author before, uh, not even now. But it was a family holiday that we went to Cairo. And the guide there, seeing that I came from India, said, look, do you want to see the tomb of an ambassador? I said, yeah, since we had a lot of time uh, left, I said, yeah, why not? So he took me to this tomb in uh, the City of Dead, which is uh, a, a sort of a huge place with a lot of uh, monuments and tombs of uh, eminent uh, people of Cairo and Egypt. Took me to a fairly large uh, mausoleum. So when we entered inside, uh, it was, I mean, I was quite shocked to see it. It was a beautiful marble tomb, but full of garbage filth used as a storage for the caretaker out there. Uh, chairs and uh, you know, flex boards and all that strewn around. Then the caretaker, realizing that I was actually interested in that, swept all the stuff that was lying on top of the marble tomb. And then I realized, yes, after reading the inscription, that One is, of course, I had heard his name from what I had read earlier in M.O. Mathai's book. And uh, so I was intrigued as to why this person, I mean, Mathai paints a rather negative picture of this man, you know. What do you get the feeling is that he was an alcoholic and nothing else. And secondly, why was so eminent a man not brought back to India to be buried? So one is, why was he buried in Cairo in such a fancy place? Second is, why wasn't he brought back to India? So this led me on a search, actually. And uh, when I read more about him, did a lot more research about him, I found him a, a very fascinating character. So it was just the, the travels that resulted in this. And I'm sort of happy to having resurrected this forgotten man. And you've given uh, possible answers to the question you just asked. Why was this man not buried in India? I'm going to hold up this book. Now, there's a lot that we are going to discuss, but I hope you will read this, buy this and read this, because it made an absolutely fascinating journey of discovery. Chris, uh, as you've seen, uh, his canvas, Syed Hussein's canvas, uh, encompassed it, uh, times which were really in turmoil in Indian politics in the world. How effective were his efforts on behalf of India? How did he change perceptions about India and Indians? Uh, well, uh, firstly, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much to Sanjeev Chopra and the Valley of Words for this uh, organization. Extremely creditable, very happy to be here. I hope I'm reasonably audible because I know that having been in the audience, there's a tremendous echo here but at least uh, I hope you can hear. Now, in regard to the question which was asked, very pertinent question, I think, um, you know, that he was really, a, I would say, what we would call today a public relations and propagandist. Yes. Yes. 
he wasn't a, a diplomat in either by character or by personality. And he began uh, life really as a journalist and there, uh, he wrote trenchant articles for Horniman in Bombay who had started a newspaper, trenchant articles about India's independence. And uh, this carried on with uh, other newspapers in first in, in um, uh, under the aegis of Motilal Nehru, then he went abroad for reasons which we'll come to, I'm sure. Uh, and he, was, he continued to be a very active propagandist for Indian independence. Uh, also for the Khilafat movement, but let's leave that aside because yes. I think that was really much of a red herring. Yeah. Then he went to the United States where he uh, went on a lecture tour and um, he continued his journalistic activities both in New York and in, uh, in Washington later on. Now in regard to his overall impact, I mean, let's remember that a lot of other persons were also, prop, um, also publicizing the cause of Indian independence abroad. Among them, very worthy is like um, Nehru himself, of course, Krishna Menon, um, Radha Krishnan, um, Sarojini Naidu, uh, Subhash Bose, of course, we can never forget him. Uh, and, uh, and Hussein probably was one of a large cast of characters. In regard to what the others achieved and what, and what um, Hussein achieved, I think that probably Vinod would be the first to say that we should not exaggerate his importance. He was uh, a tremendous, apparently a tremendous speaker, extremely attractive personality, made friends with uh, people in very high places. But in regard to specifics as to how influential he was, in the cause of Indian independence, I think probably, honestly, uh, reasonably marginal. Yes. Um, he was tasked with uh, going to England and raising awareness about India's discontent with British rule. And he was also completely opposed to racism. And these two paths in his mental makeup kept colliding. So tell us a bit about these aspects of his life and also about the huge effort he made in getting uh, citizenship rights restored for Indians in the US. So, Sai Hussain went to England for the first time in around 1908 to study at the Lincoln's Inn. And one of his closest friends who remained his close friend for the rest of his life was Asaf Ali, who later became governor of uh, Odessa. Yeah. So Asaf Ali mentions an incident um, where he and Syed Hussain, after finishing their dinner, were walking home. And on the way, a couple of white men whom they encountered on the, on the pavement abused uh, Syed Hussain using the N-word. And <laughs> Syed Hussain, though physically less intimidating than the two Britishers, mm -hmm. uh, decided to take, uh, pick up a fight with them and in fact almost succeeded in beating them black and blue till a, a policeman arrived on the scene and uh, sort of separated the two warring factions. So this characteristic of Syed Hussain for standing up for the weak and to sort of uphold his principle, whatever may be the cost, seems to be a recurrent theme throughout, throughout his life. And um, that happened when he came back to India, when uh, he edited uh, Motila Nehru's newspaper, The Independent, where despite whatever pressures that the, uh, the British police brought upon him, he continued nevertheless to report on incidents like Jallianwala Bagh, so on and so forth. So he was quite a, he was quite a pain uh, in the British uh, back, so to say. And he also reported widely when Horniman was deported to England for writing things which were uncomfortable for the British. The major event in his life which uh, transformed his life in a way was when he fell in love with Saroop Nehru, the future Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. They actually got married um, almost secretively, but when Motilal Nehru came to know about it, uh, there was objection from all quarters, from himself, from his son and from Gandhi. The marriage was honored and 
Syed Hussain was asked to go to England as part of the Khilafat delegation. I'm glad he's given you the spoiler alert about Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. So he was sort of disinvited from coming back to India and decided to go to the United States and made his life there for the next 25 years. So in the US, he set up himself as some kind of an unofficial ambassador for Gandhi, um, propagating Gandhi's views. And this was, you know, during the 1920s and 30s when Gandhi's popularity was increasing. You know, <clears throat> so he traveled to all the 50 states in the United States and gave almost about more than 2,000 lectures over this 15-year uh, period uh, <clears throat> propagating Gandhi's philosophy, as well as uh, standing up and uh, demanding civil rights for the Indian immigrants who had been there. Excuse me. I think it's really, uh, so, you know, in a way, um, he rose above uh, his personal differences with Gandhi, because uh, that's greatly to his credit. Because this uh, marriage, um, you know, this may, may be a bit debatable. I'm not sure to what extent the marriage was totally formalized. It certainly appears to have been with uh, what the future, Mrs. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, was actually put a stop to by Gandhi, yes. uh, also Motilal Nehru, also Jawaharlal Nehru in a kind of uh, love jihad type of attitude, which is really... In fact, uh, sorry, I'm butting in here. Please. Given that uh, Gandhi, it's surprising really, uh, given his posturing on Hindu-Muslim unity for public consumption, this is rather strange, you know, this attitude that how can this happen? Except that uh, I think uh, 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 Mahatma Gandhi was always against conversion. I think that um, uh, he, he, I think we, we, we've got to really face that uh, fact. He, uh, he um, said that uh, if you find any attraction in another religion, it's better to be a better person yourself in the religion that you're in than to convert. This was his attitude throughout his life. So in that sense, perhaps it was the conversion aspect of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit that he, future Pandit, that he objected to rather than the marriage itself. But the fact remains that it's because of the combined um, negative attitude of both um, Vijay Lakshmi's brother, her father, and Gandhi yeah. that, um, in fact, uh, he was banished. Then decided uh, that he would accept a proposal to have an assignment for the Congress abroad. But the amazing thing, I mean, which he, which I think he deserves a lot of credit for, is despite his what could have been a very legitimate grievance against Gandhi. He still, in USA and UK, promoted the cause very vigorously of both India and the Mahatma for Indian independence. In fact, nothing could shake him from his devotion to Gandhi. He was unwavering in his support. And uh, that's, you do wonder that why is it that Gandhi never seemed to give him at least part of the due that he owed him for this, for this devotion. So I may, let me interject out here. <clears throat> so I was, uh, so uh, coming to the point about Gandhi's objection, uh, Gandhi actually wrote an article in his Young India where he made clear his objections to inter-religious marriage. But I was quite surprised to read that myself and I have quoted that, those two paragraphs in full in the book. So it's quite surprising that Gandhi, who was otherwise a proponent of religious amity, mm -hmm. was completely against inter-religious marriage. So when I was talking to one of the leading historians in India as to why did Gandhi have this kind of a, what we could easily term as a hypocritical attitude, his point was at that time, <coughs> Gandhi depended a lot on the support of the Hindus because there was a rival Muslim league at that time mm -hmm. and the uh, the Lucknow Pact had just been signed, and therefore he was not in a position to antagonize his, his primary support amongst the Hindus by agreeing to a Hindu-Muslim marriage. And therefore, he publicly objected to this and made sure that Syed went out of India and didn't come back for the next 25 years. 
that at least is one interpretation. Yeah, and uh, you have given a letter by uh, Vijay Lakshmi Perfect. Pandit, which is actually quite explosive yes. in her views on Gandhi, but please read it because it's very interesting, sheds a lot of light yeah, on it this. It's quite irreverent yeah. the way yeah. she talks about yeah. the Atma. Yeah. And, um, you know, to come back to real politics, so to speak, we stand today uh, at a rather critical juncture in our relations with the Arab stroke Islamic world. Syed Hussein took over as India's first ambassador in Egypt at another such critical juncture. And he was also appointed uh, India's minister in Transjordan as well as Lebanon, all in 1948 over the space of that year. I wanted to ask, maybe Chris could answer this, how did he shape, what kind of an impact did he have on those diplomatic relations, especially given the time which was fraught with a lot of questions and negativity about India. There was Kashmir, there was the, India's role in the Nizams, Hyderabad. And how is it different that time, that critical juncture from today? And also given that he had to do a fine balancing act between the Egyptian monarchy and the Arab League, which win their trust, which he did. Well, that's really a tremendously omnibus question. Let me say, let me say firstly that he was ambassador for only a year. Yes. And therefore, you know, um, whatever consequences might have come from his being an ambassador would obviously be limited. You know, every ambassador takes about six months to really get into the job. And uh, so that leaves very little time left over. And I'm not really sure whether he went to, ever went to Lebanon or Transjordan or not. I, 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 he I went to Transjordan to present his credentials. To the, uh, yeah. Right. And did he go to Lebanon too? That I'm not sure. I was not able to but anyway, um, he had really very, very little time before his uh, unfortunate death. So I can't really make much comment on that, except that while it's true that there was a great deal of, uh, of uh, unpleasant uh, a fallout of the partition, etc., which um, Andrilla has referred to. Uh, the fact is, I think that, again, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the Pakistan ambassador in Cairo did declare, uh, I think he came to the funeral and uh, declared yes. um, perhaps a day of mourning or something for, for the yeah, embassy, actually, yeah. for the Pakistan yeah. embassy. And the prime minister walked in the funeral procession. They gave him a state funeral. So. Um, so that part is true. Now, the second part of your question, much harder in many ways, is the, how does it impact on the state of relations today? I think that's beyond the scope of this book, really. But let me just say that uh, I think that uh, despite um, India's uh, uh, diplomatic opening to Israel, and uh, perhaps one could say its relative neglect of the, Pakistan, the Palestinian cause in consequence of that, I think that, on the whole, the governments of Manmohan Singh and Modi have managed to navigate uh, this change with the Arab world reasonably well. And I think that, um, in respect of uh, the Arab countries, uh, India's stock has not fallen greatly as a result of its embrace, uh, mutual embrace with Israel. Uh, obviously, our relations with some Arab countries are stronger than with others. Uh, the relationship with Iran may be looking a little bit uh, uh, weaker than before now. Mm -hmm. But uh, apart from all that, I think that these, both the Congress and the BJP governments have negotiated this change uh, in relationship with Israel very satisfactorily. And the interesting thing is that Syed Hussein was completely understanding of the Zionist cause, which is very unusual for a Muslim, but he was pra quite pragmatic about that. Um, he fashioned himself in a Nehruvian mold. So with his background, his upbringing, he could have taken life easy. What made him turn to activism? And in the US, he was known as the dean, as you said, of Indian activists. I think this probably stems from his character, which was probably molded maybe right from his Calcutta days. He was a rebel. Um, he went to England, fell in love with a woman older, older than him. Eliza. Yeah, Eliza. And 
those letters are very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he had this streak of rebelliousness and anti-authoritarianism right from the very beginning. And therefore, when he went to the United States and saw how Indian immigrants were treated, uh, he decided that that would be one aspect of his activism. Of course, that activism goes back much, much before Syed Hussain, when uh, the, the first Indian immigrants went, went there in 1904. These were the Punjabi immigrants who went there as labor. And that's something which I trace in a fair amount of detail in the book, the whole history of Indian immigration to the US. But then after that, there were, there were people like Hardayal, Tarak Nath Das. Then, of course, Lajpat Rai was there for quite some time, uh, speaking about the same thing. Syed Hussain took on the baton from Lajpat Rai and continued, along with a host of other, activity, uh, act, host of other act, activists in the US. I must okay. say, uh, yeah. Andrew, uh, forgive me coming in. I'd like to say that um, uh, Mr. Vinod has dealt with the Indian diaspora, particularly in the United States, extremely well in this book. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, uh, the um, way that Syed Hussein both integrated himself with the, with the Indian community in USA and also had his difficulties with them comes out extremely well. And one thing I'd like to mention that uh, it seems that then as well as now, uh, Indian communities abroad have the same characteristic of fighting with each other. So uh, you know, there's never any uh, Indian community which seems to have a, a very clear directional push of their own. They're always at loggerhead with each other. And it happened then in London too. Now. Though, of course, in those days, uh, as the book and uh, Mr. Vinod very correctly says, their two preoccupations was uh, legitimizing their stay in the United States, and secondly, citizenship in the United States. Um, it, here was this dapper, good-looking, charming man sent to England with strong recommendations by Horniman. And incidentally, in today's Telegraph, there is a wonderful article on B.G. Horniman by uh, Ramchandra Guha. And uh, it was natural. He spoke English really well, wrote really well. So women were drawn to him. They wanted his attention, his company. And I know you've touched on this, but uh, he had an abiding feeling for Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, Sarup, as she was then, through the years. And they meet again after 24 years when she's gone to the UN. And there's no guilt. She's had a wonderful marriage. She's widowed. But what they had was genuine friendship. So tell us a bit about it, because that's one of the most charming parts of this book. So, Sarup Nehru and uh, Syed Hussain parted in 1920, uh, early 1920 when Syed Hussain was sort of exiled to England and then to the US. There is nothing that I could find that they ever met after that till 1945. That is after Vijay Lakshmi was widowed and then she was sent to the US as uh, India's representative at the uh, UN conference in San Francisco, as India's unofficial representative. Because there was an official delegation which of course was denounced by you know, all the Indian uh, uh, the freedom fighters, the Congress and so on. So they first met after 25 years when Vijay Lakshmi came to New York. And I have a first-hand uh, sort of a description of this meeting from Vijay Lakshmi's daughter mm -hmm. Nayantara, mm -hmm. Nayantara Sagar, who lives in Dehradun. So I, I met her and I, I asked her, look, was that meeting awkward? She said, no. In fact, uh, Syed Hussain first came to meet her mother, that is Nayantara's mother, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, in New York, where they had rented an apartment. Both Nayantara and her older sister, Chandraleka, was there. Syed Hussain was invited for dinner. And the, the family, that is the daughters, had known all along that this was one of those misadventures which their mother had had. So it was perfectly natural for Vijay Lakshmi and Syed Hussain to sort of meet, to continue the conversation as if nothing had happened. And they simply addressed him as Uncle Syed, and that was that. And Syed was extremely fond of both these girls, uh, to the extent that when he later became ambassador in Cairo, 
both these girls came to visit him. Yeah. There is a photograph in this book where Syed Hussain is photographed with a few others, but on the wall you can see a picture of both Nayantara and Chandraleka. He had an immense amount of affection for both these girls and likewise with their mother too. One thing I came to know after I wrote the book was uh, some of you might have heard uh, about Dr. Achila Maulik. Uh, Dr. Achila Maulik was a former uh, a retired IAS officer, former director of uh, archaeology in Delhi. Her father, uh, Dr. Maulik, was uh, first secretary to Vijay Lakshmi Pandit when she was ambassador, uh, was high commissioner of India to England. And apparently in her private study, she continued to have a, a large photograph of Syed Hussain much after his death. And uh, Achila Maulik's take is that that photograph was larger than that of her husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that, I, uh, you know, this is really getting down to the realms of tittle-tattle. But anyway... <laughs> Charming <laughs> tittle-tattle. It seems, it seems to engage persons. And, uh, well, my, my mother-in-law, who's uh, still alive at the age of 100 plus, uh, knew Mrs. Pandit very well. Mm -hmm. And she confirms that there was really a strong... Um, uh, uh, affectionate bond between her and, uh, and um, Syed Hussain. Uh, apart from that, I think that um, um, it, is, it is obviously um, true, and I think that you mentioned this in the book also, that uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit did make um, maybe two, one, perhaps two Trips visits to, to Cairo Egypt. Um, against uh, her brother's specific instructions not to stop in, in Cairo, and she did this to meet Syed Hussain on her way to Moscow, where she was posted as ambassador. Mm -hmm. So I think there is um, a very strong, um, a very strong evidence to suggest that um, uh, this uh, affection continued strongly after uh, Vijay Lakshmi uh, uh, had lost her yeah. husband, Mr. Pandit. And I have to tell you that there are some other romances that Vinod has hinted at, talked about in the book amongst people, eminent figures in the freedom struggle and otherwise those days. But to find out about that, I think you should read the book. And uh, it's rather just, fortunate that the, <laughs> that the dead cannot defend themselves. <laughs> Can I just make one, um, one quotation from um, Mr. Vinod's book here? that he says, Hossein's devotion to the Mahatma stopped well, of, well short of emulating his lifestyle. I think, I think, I think uh, that sums it up perfectly. <laughs> In fact, uh, uh, that's something that, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about. I mean, here was Gandhi and Hossein, completely different. They were poles apart. And as you said, Gandhi was one of the key figures in getting that marriage annulled after that elopement, but, uh, and he also completely disapproved, or would have, of the sybaritic lifestyle, the self-indulgence, the spendthrift qualities, his dependence, later dependence on drink, but he was unwavering in his loyalty. And that's something we've talked about. So obviously there was this quality that demanded that kind of uh, loyalty. But uh, coming back to uh, uh, Chris, you know, obviously in the book, he was dead against partition, Hussein, and it is something that he probably really regretted, ironical, that most of his family shifted to Pakistan and settled there, because he chose a secular path to freedom. He was completely secular, absolutely against any kind of religious, uh, you know, mores, religious uh, fundamentalism. So, and that in fact is something very interesting in his relationship with Jinnah, which you've talked about uh, through the book. First friendship and then uh, disappointment down to anger. There's a powerful letter that he wrote to Jinnah. He was absolutely disgusted by then with Jinnah's changing polit politics. But, you know, this man, what is it about India, he always believed in the concept of India and what it stood for, 
How did that shape his diplomatic career or his career, as Chris said, in PR, in uh, doing publicity for India? I think, like, <coughs> I think, like Mr. Krishnan pointed out, his career were, as an ambassador was far too short to make. No, I'm talking about US, about UK, everything. Yeah. Your, Europe. But Syed Hussain, I think, right from the very beginning, to use his own term, believed in the civilizational unity of India. And therefore, it came as a huge disappointment to him that his, his friend, Jinnah, was actually instrumental in cutting this country. He and Jinnah actually go back a long way. I mean, they were in England uh, uh, during the Khilafat movement yeah. times. Um, Asaf Ali, Jinnah, Sarojini and Syed Hussain were very close friends. They used to meet very often at the Liberal Club. When Syed Hussain became assistant editor of uh, the Bombay Chronicle under the editorship of Horniman, Jinnah was actually the chairman of the Board of Governors of Bombay Chronicle. So their relationship was in fact very close. And Syed Hussain was obviously extremely disappointed that Jinnah took the route that he took to divide the country. Um, and what is surprising about this is that at the time of the Khilafat movement, Jinnah and Motilal actually objected to Gandhi supporting the Khilafat movement. And Jinnah's words were, this is letting the mullah element yes. into the politics. So Jinnah was absolutely against the Khilafat movement supported by Gandhi. I think later, it is probably his own ego, and this is one of the interpretations, that he wanted his own country at any cost. Though I think he himself was very secular in his behavior, in his comportment, in, in the way he dressed, in what he ate, uh, I think he used religion as a tool to get his country. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned his, um, a bit of his journalistic career. So tell us a bit more about it, because that was an absolutely stellar part of his career. Uh, the Bombay Chronicle, uh, B.G. Horniman's Blue-Eyed Boy, The Independent. Motilal really chased him for that and uh, the New Orient, for which Julia Ford and Khalil Gibran were regular contributors. I mean, he certainly got to know the right people at the right time. And he was, in fact, one of the speakers who paid tribute to Gibran after his death. So tell us about that. So uh, Syed Hussain actually started his career in, as a journalist in Calcutta when uh, Horniman was the assistant editor of The Statesman. <coughs> So from here, uh, then after coming back from, from England, he was assistant editor of the Bombay Chronicle. Then Motilal Nehru personally selected him and requested Horniman to release him so that he could edit the Independent in Allahabad. After that, uh, once he went to England, he was for a very short while the editor of this magazine called India, which was <coughs> the British mouthpiece of the Indian National Congress. That, of course, was a very brief stint for about four months. Then he went to the United States, and that is where I think his uh, journalistic career, or in a way, took off. He edited the periodical The New Orient for almost about four years, and which had amongst its contributors some of the best-known intellectuals of the day. And that was E.G. Wells, Bertrand Russell, Albert Einstein, Indian contributors, uh, uh, Gandhi contributed in Article 2 and um, Ananda Kumaraswamy, who was uh, the curator of the Boston Museum. Uh, that, that, those magazines of those four years read like a veritable who's who of the intellectuals of the world. Uh, so when I was actually going through them in the New York Public Library, I was just surprised how this man could get contributors such as this. I mean, and these are all extremely erudite and, uh, you know, timeless articles that uh, he got published. There was one uh, called Lullaby by Khalil Gibran. Yes. And the same one had something, an article on Aknaton by Julia yes. Ford. Yes. And uh, I'd just like to read two paras, short paras, mm -hmm. to show how powerful and biting his pen could be. He writes to Winston Churchill, you have cried to high heavens against the Axis and summoned the whole world to liberate their captives. What about the 400 millions of great and ancient people held in British bondage? 
Your specious and ignoble pleas debase the moral currency of the world. He goes on to write, a great Englishman, G.K. Chesterton, once put these words in the mouths of a British judge, which he addressed to a British prime minister. Get a new soul. That thing's not fit for a dog. Get a new soul. Just a little bit about how powerfully he could write. And I'm going to request you later to read a paragraph uh, from the book before we end. But just a couple of questions before we take uh, questions from the floor. Uh, Chris, would you like to comment on what made him the really attractive uh, speaker on a lucrative lecture circuit that he did become? In fact, Yeah. Remarkable as a person of no consequence, really, arriving in Britain to uh, study law and having that galaxy of, uh, of uh, people that he met there. I mean, that's really, I mean, shows some remarkable qualities. And I think qualities which Mr. Vinod has brought out very yes. well in his book. Um, I think that uh, in regard to um, his uh, lectures, of course, none of us ever heard him. And uh, uh, we don't know really what the impact of those lectures was, but it seems to have been very considerable uh, because he was a great, uh, he was very popular on the lecture tour. And uh, he, in fact, was one of the first, I think, in America to engage an agent to organize his lectures for yes. him, which is really, um, you know, something which we are familiar with today, but not, was not so common in the 1920s and 1930s. So he must have been a great uh, attraction um, because agents don't promote people unless they make money out of it. So uh, he obviously was really quite remarkable in that respect. Beyond that, I really, uh, I really don't know because uh, um, despite his differences in lifestyle and uh, in, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, attitudes to various things, uh, his differences with uh, Nehru, Gandhi and others of the liberation movement. And he was appointed as ambassador very quickly. Yes. Uh, this was a time when uh, Indian uh, ambassadors and representatives of war were chosen from a wide range of persons. Mm. Uh, some came from the ICS, but many came from uh, the armed forces, others came from other professions. And um, Saeed Hussain was therefore not unusual in that respect, but, but what marked him out as being special, uh, having spent so much time abroad? Uh, that's, uh, that's a question that really defies uh, a, a simple answer, except that obviously persons in charge in India, Nehru of course being the main one, yes. saw some spe special spark in Hussain, which um, made him eligible to be posted straight away as an ambassador to an important country. Uh, we know that uh, we're coming to the end of our session, I think. So I'm going to ask you, what is the state of that tomb today? And there was this interesting story about the Princess of Jordan, oh, yes. who was his niece, his I daughter. I was probably one of the uh, <clears throat> good followers of the book. Uh, Syed Hussain's niece, that is his sister's daughter, was Shaista Ikramullah. She was the wife of Mr. Ikramullah, who was the first foreign secretary of Pakistan. And she herself was uh, uh, posted as the ambassador to Morocco at the same time when Syed Hussein was India's ambassador to Egypt. Their daughter, uh, Princess Sarvat, uh, she's the Princess of Jordan. Uh, Princess Sarvat Al Hassan is married to Prince Al Hassan, who's the younger brother. Yeah, younger brother of the. Uh, King former Abdullah. King Hussein and the paternal uncle of oh. uh, King Abdullah. So <clears throat> during the course of uh, my writing, I was in constant touch with uh, uh, Mr. Syed Iqbal Ahmad, who is Syed Hussein's niece from his 
older brother. So he lives, he marks time between Albany and uh, uh, Dhaka. And um, apart from sort of providing me material from his family archives, he also kept the princess in touch with my work. So after my book was published, uh, Princess Sarvath wrote a very nice letter to me and she said, look, I promise you that I will get this tomb renovated as soon as possible. So my book was published in January and then again I get a letter from her in May um, through Mr. Syed Iqbal Ahmad uh, with a video where she had sent her officials to Egypt mm -hmm. and the video showed a cleaned up tomb and with the uh, officials discussing modalities for renovating the tomb. So I think that was a good fallout of, uh, of the book. I'm so happy that Princess Sarvath took it upon herself to do this. Excellent. Uh, Anjum, uh, uh, Audrilla, can sorry. I just yeah. make one comment before you uh, open the floor for uh, open the floor for questions? That is that you know this is uh, allow me to say sure. it's it's Mr. Vinod's first book, and uh, it's a remarkable achievement as that he has done this research, he's done the studies, he has explored um, the life of a person who very few of us ever heard about, and. Uh, this is a completely new incarnation as far as Mr. Vinod is concerned. Um, and uh, he's done a signal service, I think, to Indian history and Indian biography in having yeah. discovered, explored, and written about uh, Syed Hussain. Remark remarkable achievement, if I may say so. Thank you, sir. And a Calcutta boy. So, last question to you, uh, if you want to read uh, something short. And I wanted to ask you that, uh, are you thinking of writing another book? Have you identified a subject? No, I think this, this happened by accident. Hopefully, the next book will also be an equal, equally accidental fortunate event. <laughs> okay, great accident. Would you like to read a piece? We're going to take a few questions from the audience, if there are any. I'll just read a short uh, yeah. piece from the front. Yeah from the prologue. Uh, <clears throat> Despite being a prolific writer and speaker, Syed was parsimonious in what he said about himself. There is no autobiography that he wrote, no biography that he authorized, no copious letters that he penned, and no self-congratulatory interviews that he gave. It may have been extreme modesty or an intense reluctance to reveal anything of himself. Here was a man who was relegated to insignificance by his country and history, despite his immense contributions and achievements. A nationalist editor across three continents, a member of the sole delegation that met the British Prime Minister to plead for the Khilafat cause, the solitary unofficial ambassador for India's independence movement in America for many years, a champion, a champion for the citizenship rights of Indians in the United States, a virtuoso in the English language, and the list goes on. Syed Hussain remained resolute in his principles despite the tribulations he had to endure. A life of bachelorhood, an exile from his country, and sorrows he tried to assuage by taking to the drink. He lived in a Shakespearean tragedy. This book is an attempt to tilt the scales to portray one who deserved a higher claim to fame. Someone who, despite the pulls of religious bigotry, remained steadfast in his loyalty to India and to his greatest son, Mahatma Gandhi. It is equally an attempt to narrate the events of the times, especially those of the first Indians who mass migrated to America in the early 20th century, and to rescue from a collective amnesia the more prominent among them whose battle against racial oppression paved the way for the second mass migration of Indians to America from the 1960s. Syed Hussein belonged to that generation of Indian leaders that was baptized into politics by Gandhi himself a group that combined a formidable scholarship of their own culture with the sophistication of Western liberalism and an unwavering nationalism that rose above sectarian distinctions. They were the finest that India produced. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take... Yes, Sanjum. Taking, a, taking the privilege of asking the first question. Um, I wanted to know that in the course of this journey of exploration and discovery, what to you was a high point in terms of either an, a complete surprise or a complete pleasure? One was, of course, uh, meeting some of the people who actually knew Syed Hussain and who had lived through that part of history. And two examples are, of course, uh, Mr. Hussain's nephew, uh, 
Syed Iqbal Ahmad, who went through the horrors of partition and he was able to describe in great detail as to why his, part of his family decided to move to East Pakistan at that time. The second was, of course, my meeting with uh, Nayantra Saigal. Uh, she is a repository of Indian history herself. Mm. And talking to her over two days was perhaps the finest experience that I had in writing this book. The other not so good thing that I found was that there is so much of material about India in libraries abroad, which are not there in our own libraries. For instance, the uh, India Library in London, as well as the Columbia University Library and the Library at the University of Chicago have such a huge material of India that is not accessible to us either online or in terms of physical books. And that is, I think, uh, that is something which I think have hampers original research in India. And uh, that's the reason why this morning, you know, this concept of the India Digital Library, I think is a great idea. It really helped researchers mm -hmm. to explore India further. Thanks, any more questions? Okay, if there aren't, I'd just like to ask one about Calcutta. He lived in Taltolla, right. Asylum Lane or Street. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to say is that he had a fairly checkered time in Calcutta. Uh, families' uh, fortunes uh, didn't go so well. He couldn't get into Calcutta University, went to Alighur. But then he was known to do things like that. He went to the inns of court but didn't become a lawyer, yes. become a journalist. So tell us a bit more about his time in Calcutta. So his, his grandfather on the maternal side was quite an eminent educationalist, Nawab Abdul Latif. <clears throat> in fact, a road in Taltala is named after him. And uh, he was considered as one of, the, um, one of the biggest social reformers of that time, and one who encouraged the Muslim community to learn English, because that would advance their career in the, in the British government. His father was... Um, Nawab Syed Muhammad, um, who rose to the rank of Inspector General of Registrations in pre-independent India. And, and, it, and I believe it was a very, very senior position. So he actually came from a, a landed aristocratic family, which was educated, not merely in English, but also in Bengali and Persian. And he grew up in Taltala in the company of you know, both his grandfather and father, who was a, a very senior person studied at the Calcutta Madrasa in those days, which is now the Alia University. I think his weakness in maths is what prevented him from studying at Calcutta University. So the, uh, the principal of his college wrote a letter to the principal of the Aligarh Muslim University. At that time, it was called the MAO College, Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College, uh, where he was then given admission to do his FAO, that is, or rather FA, uh, which is equivalent to our intermediate. Okay, uh, questions, anyone? Yes, Sanjum. Yeah, somebody else is asking, I'm taking the liberty. Please do. Um, when he was in Calcutta, did he meet Maulana Abul Kalam Azad? Because they would both have been active around the same time or not quite? That would have been later because he left Calcutta somewhere around 1908. Uh, so I have not really explored that part of it, but uh, I do mention that he met uh, the, uh, the brothers who ran, uh, ran the Khilafat movement, uh, Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. when they visited uh, the Aligarh Muslim University at that time. Ranjita, Shelley, questions? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, it's all right. Okay. And his first job was with the government in Bengal. Said the same. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll call it a day, Anjum. It's time, I think. Right? Uh, I just wanted to say that when I started this book, it was really uh, something that I had no clue about. There are so many figures, so many tiny, minuscule cogs in that huge web, in that huge wheel that was 
uh, independence movement. But he was unimportant. Chris was so right. He wasn't as important as he perhaps thought he was or should have been. But his contribution was important. And to know about people like that is very important for us because that is our heritage. That is what makes us who we are. To have somebody who was so completely above religion, who believed that humanity and humankind was so important. So this is a really important book. Please read it. It puts into perspective a section of people, great detail about his time in America, in the US, how he went about changing perceptions, doing what he did, and with effect. So please do pick it up and read it. Thank you for writing it, Vinod. This was truly wonderful. Thank you, Valley of Words, for inviting us to do this.